I would like you to imagine that you're standing in front of a vending machine. You're wearing a Packers shirt, of course, because, I mean, we're in Wisconsin, and you're diehard Packers fans. And you're scanning through the options, super hungry, not really any good options. So you land on Cheetos. You put in your quarters, you push B17, the thing starts turning, the Cheetos start coming at you, you're going, all right, this is gonna be good. They hang up, they pause for that, time just freezes, and you're like, I will tip this machine over if you don't give me my, and then luckily, I mean, just right before you do something that you would totally regret, they fall, thunk at the bottom, you fish them out, you're opening them up, and right as you're about to take that first Cheeto, you look over and you see a dude leaning up against the next machine, He's about mid-30s, scraggly beard, could use a shower. And he says to you, first of all, he's wearing a bear's shirt, and he says to you, I got a bear. he says to you, uh, why don't you give me some of those Cheetos? And you're like, what on earth is going on? You're a Bears fan, I'm obviously a Packers fan. He's like, get your own Cheetos, what's going on? And, he, and then he gets super mysterious and weird, and he goes, uh, listen, if you knew who I was, you'd be asking me to give you Cheetos. And the Cheetos I'd give you, it changed your life. And you're like, what's this? Like two, two seconds ago, you were telling me to give you Cheetos. And now you're telling me that I should, I, I should be asking you to give me Cheetos. And what's this? You got some sort of magic Cheetos? What's going on? And he says, no, no, listen. Anyone who eats the Cheetos that come out of this vending machine, they're going to be hungry again in about 20 minutes. But the Cheetos I give them, they'll never be hungry again. And now you're just intrigued. You're like, okay, all right, Cheeto man. Let's, uh, let's see them, where, where are they at? And then he goes, hey, before that, I wanna talk to you about that thing. And right when he says that thing, he describes perfectly. He's like, you know that thing? He describes perfectly your deepest, darkest secrets. It's like he just takes the skeleton out of your closet and describes it in perfect detail. And then you're going, okay, this is not a, your average Bears fan. Uh, and, and you end up having this deep conversation with him where he, he talks about life and he talks about religion and you, t- you talk about God and your mind's just being blown to the point where you run out into town and you get all your Packers fan friends and say, y'all, you guys gotta come meet this guy. You gotta meet this, this bear. I, I just met this Bears fan. And they're like, wait, a Bears fan? I don't wanna meet a Bears fan. And he's like, no, no, just trust me. He's not like a normal Bears fan. He told me all this and that and the other thing. And this is a very poor analogy that sort of illustrates what goes on in John chapter 4. In John chapter 4, Jesus meets with a woman and she totally gets her life changed. She's never the same again. This is a powerful, fascinating, life-changing uh, passage of scripture. And I just want to, I want to walk us through it. So I'm going to dive in right at verse 7. What you need to know is that Jesus is walking through this region of Israel called Samaria. Uh, It's the middle of the day. Uh, They're getting a little tired. They stop by a city. Jesus hangs out by a well, and his disciples go off into the city to buy lunch. And it says this, uh, right at the end of verse 6, It says, it was about the sixth hour. That means it's high noon, right? Heat of the day. And then something very odd, very interesting happens right here. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Why is this odd? Why is this interesting? Two reasons. One, at this time, women came in the cool of the day, uh, the cool of the morning or the cool of the evening to draw water, not right in the middle of the day, not in the heat of the day. Two, Women came to draw water in groups because it was social and it was more secure. All right, social, it's something we do together and it's secure, it's safer. You're, 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 if you're in a group, you're safer from the riffraff. But this woman, she comes, she, she's by herself. She comes right in the middle of the day and that tells you immediately she's a social outcast. She's a pariah, and we're going to learn uh, a few verses down why that is. It's because she's got a past. She's got a past. Everyone knows about her, and everyone knows to keep away from her, right? She's not, she's not welcome. She's not accepted by general, the general public and definitely not a member of the WWC, right? The Women's Water Club. She's a complete pariah, okay? And Jesus says to her, hey, um, would you give me a drink? 
Verse nine, the, the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Now, you would normally think these are two humans, right? So there's, there should be a human next to a human. There should be no separation here. But what you gotta understand is that at the time, there was, Jews had nothing to do with Samaritans. There was serious animosity. There was hostility, uh, ethnic, political, and most of all, religious. So they avoided each other. They were like oil and water. So not only is Jesus a Jew, and this woman is a Samaritan, but Jesus is a Jewish man, and she is a Jewish or a Samaritan woman. Like men wouldn't even talk to women in public at this time. So there was separation. And, and not only was Jesus a Jewish man, but he was a, a rabbi, a religious leader. He occupied a position of prominence in society, whereas this woman was not just a Samaritan woman, but a woman of ill repute. Someone in Jesus' position would have never associated with someone of her social status. And Jesus just crashes across those lines and he engages her and he says, give me a drink. And she's going, are you, how, how are you asking me for a drink? How's that, how's that even possible? And Jesus says to her, verse 10, if you, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. See, right off the bat, you see the way that Jesus moves her from the surface, superficial things toward deep soul things. Jesus says, man, I don't wanna talk about water. I wanna talk about living water. I don't wanna talk about physical thirst. I wanna talk about soul thirst. And the woman said to him, sir, you, you have nothing to draw water with. And the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? And you can almost hear the sass in her voice because one, she, first of all, she thinks he's still talking about H2O and he's just so not talking about H2O. And second of all, she's like, are you, are you trying to pick a fight or something? Are you greater than our father, Jacob? He gave us this well and drank from it himself and his whole family and all his cows too. Like, like are you, do, you, do you seriously, just like all the other Jews, you guys think you're so much better than us? And Jesus is like, yeah, yeah I get it. Listen, I'm not trying to pick a fight. Listen, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. Jesus is saying, I want to talk to you about a different water. I want to talk, I want to talk about a better water. I want to talk about a deeper thirst. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Jesus says, that's the water I want to talk about. I want to talk about the kind of water that satisfies your soul's deepest longings because, because, because woman, listen to me, whether you know it or not, you have a void in you that you are trying to fill with cheap substitutes and until you accept what I'm offering you, you are gonna go from well to well to well. I wanna talk about a different water. What, what kind of water is he talking about when he says living water? He's talking about new life with God where we, we know God and we're known by God and we experience his love and his faithfulness and his forgiveness and his goodness and it's life changing and he absolutely satisfies the deepest longings of our soul. And when does it start? Sunday afternoon and it keeps going on Wednesday all the way for eternity. Jesus says, that's the water. That's the water I'm trying to talk to you about. And she starts to get it. She, she says to him, sir, get, give me this water so, so I will not be thirsty or have to come here again. Does she get it entirely? No, she doesn't get it entirely. She's not all the way yet, there yet, but she's starting to say, man, there's, there's, something, there's something different. There's something different about this Jesus. There's something deeper about, the, about whatever it is he's talking about. And if it means that I don't have to come here anymore to this place of public shame, 
This place where I'm humiliated, where every single bad, stinking decision I've ever made is just rubbed in my face. They pin my past on my chest like some sort of scarlet A where I, it's so apparent that I'm an outcast. If I don't have to come here anymore, sure, I'll, I'll take what you're selling. She starts to get it, and Jesus knows there's something deeper that's still separating her from God her sin, and so he brings it into the light. Verse 19, sorry, verse 16, Jesus says, go, call your your husband and come here. The woman answered him, "I, uh, I, I have no husband. Listen, we can get pretty creative when it comes to trying to hide our own sin, can't we? Jesus says to her, well, yeah, I mean, Technically, you are right in saying, I have no husband. He says, you've had five husbands. And the one you have now is not your husband. What you've said is technically true. Jesus knows her, her public sinful past. And he knows her private sinful present And he exposes it to her, not in front of the whole village. Not in front of anyone else. It's just one-on-one. It's just the two of them. And Jesus brings her sin into the light. And why? Why does he do this? To condemn her? To to, to rub it in her face? And to, to shame her? No. And Jesus does this to set her free. Jesus brings up our past, not to shame our present, but to change our future. And how does he do it? He moves past the the, the symptoms of sin and moves us to the root of the sin problem. Jesus says, listen, you've been drinking at the wrong well. You've been drinking at the wrong wells. This woman, man after man after man. You guys, five failed marriages. And she was thinking, you you could tell every single one. She's thinking, man, this is the one. This time it's going to be different. This one, that thing that's in me that that, that ain't quite right, that that, that, that thirst I've got deep in my soul that I just can't seem to quench. I I think this is going to be it. Over and over and over again, this is only to be left just as empty as before. And this is the same, this is the same web we're caught up in. We're, we're not different. Like if we can't see ourselves in this woman, we miss the point of this passage. And I don't know if it's in your life, it's like, if it's like this, if it's from partner to partner, from boyfriend to boyfriend, to girlfriend to girlfriend, or website to website, or job to job, to a new hobby, a new wardrobe, a new hairstyle, a new workout plan, a, a new fad diet, a, I don't know, maybe a new church, maybe even a new location, and we just move and move and move, and we, one well to another well to another well, and at first sip, you're like, no, this is, I think this is it, this is, the, this is gonna be the one. And you end up, now. I'm just as empty. I'm just as discontent as I ever have been. And Jesus says, listen, until you receive what I'm offering you, you are not going to know true soul satisfaction. Jesus says, I want to talk about living water. Now, this woman is exposed before Jesus, and she says, I perceive that you are a prophet. So you hear what she says there? She's going, you, got, you nailed me, you, you figured me out. You're, no, you know what, you're right. You're absolutely right, I'm not perfect. And I don't know, you must be some sort of prophet or something, I don't know how you knew all that stuff about me. But yeah, you're right. And then she throws up one last line of defense, religion. I don't know how many times I've been explaining the simplicity of the gospel to someone in the past. And they just explain, man, listen, Jesus took the cross to pay for your sin. He rose again to reconcile us to God. And, and the person goes, yeah, great. I, I get it. But what about natural disasters? Or to evolution? How do, how do you explain that? Just throw up a theological conundrum, something that doesn't quite line up. And watch Watch the way Jesus 
untangles this knot that she tosses him, this religious knot. He's so brilliant. He's so, Jesus is so winsome. Listen to what he, what, what he uh, oh, sorry, listen to the actual objection. She says, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you, the Jews, say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship, right? Religious objection. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. An hour's coming when none of that's going to matter because that's so not what it's about. He does explain, you, you Samaritans, you worship what you, you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. All he's saying is, it, it, yes, the, the Jews are a little closer to being on track. You Samaritans, you're a little further from being on track, but none of that matters. Verse 23, because the hour is coming and it's here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is he's seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit. Do you hear what he's saying there? He's saying it's not about the religious stuff. Do the right things at the right times in the right places. It's so not about that. God is spirit and he's looking for people to worship him in spirit. What does that mean? From the inside. This is internal from, the, from, from your heart. From the deepest part of our soul. The place where God only sees so Jesus is saying, God's looking for people that will worship him out of that. It's internal. It's not external motions you can go through. If it's about doing the right things in the right places at the right times, we could all do it and still hate God inside. To worship in spirit is to worship in a way you can't fake it because it's something going on in the, place, in the part of us that only God sees. And in truth, that simply means according to God's terms. He sets the terms and conditions, not us. Simple as that. And now this, this woman, she, she, he has moved, Jesus has moved her from, from surface level things to deeper things. He's moved her through her sin and past it, and he's moved her through her religious theological objections, and now she's barrierless. Okay. It's gone. And it's starting to click. The lights are starting to come on. She's starting to go, I think I know who you are. I think I know who you are. She says, I know that Messiah is coming. Who's Messiah? Just That's God's anointed one. Okay? The Savior, a new kind of king that God had promised was going to come and rescue us all from hell and sin and death and all of it. That guy. And, he, and she start, he's coming into focus. And she says, I know that Messiah is coming. I know. Are you, are, are you, are you, am I, am I, am I thinking right? I know when he comes, he's going to explain all this stuff. So much is going to make sense. So much is going to click. And Jesus says to her, and listen, this is the line. John included this narrative to drop this bomb, this line right here. She's saying, I think, are you the Messiah? Is it, can it really be? And Jesus says, I who speak to you. And he, Jesus, it's like pulls the, the, you know, Superman exposes who he really is, right? Jesus reveals his messianic identity. And listen, the very first person he reveals his messianic identity to is not some sparkly, clean, perfect religious person, but a broken, sinful Samaritan woman who could not have been trying harder to run away from God. And Jesus comes into her world and meets her where she's at and brings her to God. And she goes, she just, this is, I love this verse, this is verse 28. She, uh, let me find where we at. So the woman left her water jar. I don't know how much water jars cost back in the day, but she didn't even care. She just left it and she runs into town and she says to the people, now come and see, you guys have to meet this guy. Come and see him. Man, he told me everything I've ever done, which you guys know was a lot, right? Because y'all talk about it all the time. He told me all that stuff. Could this be the Christ? And then the people from the Samaritan village, they just start coming out and, and hanging out with Jesus and listening to him. And they're like, hey, would you, would you camp out here longer? And he tacks on two days. He camps out with them. And then uh, this is how it wraps up. I love verse 41. 
And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves and we know that this indeed is the savior of the world. And what a declaration. And check this out. They came because of what she said, but they stayed because of who he is. There is nothing more powerful you can do in someone's life than invite them to come, just meet Jesus. I know it's it's hard, I know it's awkward, but a huge part of our heart is just to make that easy for you. If you wager your relational coin and, and invite someone to church, I'll tell you what, week in and week out, I promise you, Brian and I, we're gonna open up God's word and we're gonna preach Christ and people will have the chance to get to know him. People will have the chance to meet Jesus because this is everything because, because this separation, it's not supposed to be there. Okay? We are designed to be near God, to be in a relationship with God, to know him, to be known by him, to experience his love and his kindness and his grace and his faithfulness and his forgiveness in our lives. But just like the, the Samaritan woman 2,000 years ago, man, there's something that separates us. And so I gotta ask right now, what's separating you? What is separating you from God? What is the thing that's making you keep God and and everything about him at arm's distance? What is it? You might think right off the bat, man, it's church people. You know, they're just such hypocrites. And they're so judgmental. They just think they're so much better than everyone else. And you know what, come to think of it, it's not just church people today. And all throughout history, there's garbage in Christian history. So, you know, they think about the Crusades, nonsense, and, you know, the, what about the KKK? Don't, didn't all those dudes claim to be Christian, too? If that's what it's all about, I don't want anything to do with it. And you know what? It's not just in history, too. It's in the news today, right? We read about pedophilia being co- covered up by the Catholic Church. You read about sexual harassment being covered up by the evangelical church, the club that we're a part of. You read about that stuff and you go, man, if that's their thing, I don't want anything to do with it. And you you might even say, you know what, I've got some theological, some religious objections too. How does this make sense? If there is a God that's so good and so powerful, why, why why is there evil? Why is there pain? Why is there suffering? Why does that exist? Or maybe, you know what, come to think of it, if he's supposedly this God of love, why is there a hell? That doesn't make sense. Or you know what, and come to think of it, who's Jesus to say he's the only way? What right does he have? And who are Christians? Like to, to think you are the ones that got it all figured out. And you might even have some personal stuff. I mean, this is real. This is real stuff. All important stuff does absolutely needs to be talked through. And you might have some personal hurt too. There might have been someone in your life that claimed to be a Christian or claimed to be religious and they hurt you. You might have been hurt by a church. It's real. I'm not dismissing that at all. But if we are real with ourselves, if we're going to be honest, just like the woman 2,000 years ago, there's something so much deeper that's separating us from God. Whether you and I are willing to admit it or not, There is something so much deeper in us that's separating us from God. Let's just be honest. Let's separate us some more. Talk about, how about my own dishonesty? Let's talk about my own hatred. Let's talk talk about my own lust, my adulterous heart. How about, let's take a couple steps for my pride. How about my own self-centeredness? How about the fact that I'm going to control my life? I'm going to control it. Nobody else is going to control my life. I'm the king. I'm going to say, nobody else. God, look how far, look how separated we are from God. And you got the whole world is standing around you saying, you're fine. You're just fine. Right where you're at. Right where you're at. You just, you live how you want to live. You're perfect. You live how you want to live. You do what you want to do. Whatever feels good, you just keep doing that. You're fine. And then religion stands from above and looks down on people and says, if you were worthy enough, you would figure out how to get back to God. If you were good enough, 
If you were good enough, you could do enough of the good things. Do the good things, do the right things, don't do the bad things, stay away from the wrong things. But you do all the good stuff and pretty soon you're gonna be able to just kind of crawl. Maybe you'll just crawl your way back to God. Somehow you can climb there and if you're lucky, he'll be standing there and he'll be like, what, I've been watching you. Man, you've, you've been a pretty good person. You, yeah, you, I've been watching, not all those other trolls, they're all terrible, but you, you're a pretty good person. And Jesus looks at us and he says, no, no. Okay, the world says you're fine, religion says figure it out. Jesus says forget them both. Jesus says you're not fine where you're at. You're drowning in your sin. The wages of your sin is death. They are separating you from God. You're not fine where you're at and you're never gonna be able to somehow climb some sort of moral ladder back to God. You're never gonna be able to string enough good things together to outweigh, you're not gonna tip the balances here. So Jesus just leaves it all. He leaves it all and he enters into our world, into our Samaria, and he meets us at our well, wherever we're at, the place of our shame, the place of our pain. He meets us at our well and he says, come on, I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you about your I want to talk to your soul. I want to talk to you about your deepest soul first. Let's talk about your sin. Let's talk about why you're doing it. And let's talk about, let's, let's talk about what it's doing in your life. But most importantly, let, I want to talk to you about what I did. I want to talk to you about what I did to deal with your sin. I took the cross to deal with this. Let me, Jesus says, let me bring you to God, all right, let me show you what God's like. You wanna know what God's like, let me show you. Let me be the one who reconciles you back to God. This is the gospel, this is the good news, this is what we're about. Not being fine, not figuring it out, but Jesus. And I don't know what well you've been drinking at, but Jesus says, I offer you something so much better. And he, he is here. He has come into your Samaria. He is, he is at your well. And he's ready to offer you living water. Stand with me. I'm gonna close us in prayer. And after I do, I'm gonna be standing right here. If you wanna pray about anything, maybe you've never followed Jesus a day in your life and you're ready to take a first step, Maybe you used to follow Jesus and you've wandered away and you want to come back and start following him again. Maybe you, you're following Jesus and you just need to pray about something that's going to help you keep following Jesus. I'll be here if you want to pray. And there's a bunch of other people here that'd be willing to pray too. Pray with me. Jesus, I see the way, just like you did with this woman 2,000 years ago, you, you met her right where she was at. And you sorted through her superficiality, you sorted through her religion, and you dealt with her sin, and you brought her back to God. And when she, when she ran back into that town, she was a different person. There's peace and joy because she had tasted living water. And I believe with every fiber of my being that you are here ready to do the same thing over and over and over again, that you are ready to give living water to anyone who will receive it. So I pray, Jesus, that whatever wall we are building around our hearts, that every, every person in this room, whatever wall they're building around their hearts, that Jesus, you would just melt that and that they would see that you are so good and we are so lost without you, that they would see that you offer something so much better in your wonderful and powerful and glorious name. Amen. May God bless you and keep you. May he give you peace in Jesus' name. We'll see you next week.